Uh, tonight for me is a big treat. Uh, Dr. Omar Abdullah Farooq is somebody who, uh, Dr. Omar was always old for me. Uh, I first met him when I was about 18 years old. Uh, I was wet behind the ears and we met in a garden in Granada in Spain. And he was like the old man of the mountain. And I realized that he was actually only, he was less than 30 years old at the time. <laughs> so uh, he was not old, but he seemed old because he is an old soul. He's a very wise man. And arguably, I, I think we could make a very strong case that he's probably the single most learned Muslim scholar that we have in the United States, um, at least in my estimation. Uh, I've been a, a student of his from the first time that I met him. I've been honored to know him. In 1970, he was doing a PhD in English literature, Shakespeare, and uh, he read the autobiography of Malcolm X, and that led him to uh, an interest in Islam. He ended up actually going to the Univ University of Chicago and doing a PhD in Islamic studies. I've actually read his dissertation. Um, it's amazing that somebody could know that much uh, at that time, uh, and he, he's recently done an extraordinary book on Imam Madik's Medheb in Medina. Uh, he's a very serious uh, theologian. He's a, a serious historian. He's also a, 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 a polyglot, uh, knows many languages. And so we're, we're very honored to have him here at Zaytuna, and uh, we also want to, behind every great man, is a woman rolling her eyes. <laughs> no. Behind every great man is truly a great woman. And uh, Dr. Omar's wife is here tonight, Haja Samira, who I've also had the good fortune of knowing for many years. So we're deeply honored to have them. And without further ado, Dr. Omar is going to uh, lecture us. And then we'll break for Maghrib and then have a, uh, a conversation. Assalamu alaikum. Very happy to be here in such a blessed gathering in such a blessed place. And um, what I'd like to talk about tonight, Ba'da Bismillahi Rahmani Rahim, wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, is considering what it means to be human and to be humane in the light of the fitra, which is the natural condition of the human being, the primordial soul. This is, of course, a, a very big, a very central Islamic teaching. I actually wrote a book about that which came out in Arabic. I wrote it from 1997 to the year 2000 called al Imanu Fitra, that faith is a matter of fitra. And it's been published, it's available through Darul Faqih. Uh, what I say tonight is very much taken from that, but the book goes into a lot of details. It studies many verses in the Quran that pertain to the primordial nature of human beings. We'll look at uh, actually maybe two of those tonight. And then it looks at the many hadith, which are very, very many that deal with the fitrah also. It would be very difficult to find any religious dispensation or any community that has such a positive view of human nature as Islam does. And of course, we believe as Muslims that that is the teaching of all prophets and all messengers. It may be clear in some faiths and it may not be so clear in others, but it's certainly not something that we originated or that is unique to us, but it's very clear in our tradition and um, so we, I'd like to talk about the fitrah, and in that we'll talk about what we should be, what we should not be. 
One of the main verses about the fitra in the Quran is in surah number 30, which is called Arum, the Byzantines, verse number 30. And this verse says, set your face, which means your entire being, to the religion as a seeker of truth, Hanif, very difficult word to translate. And the Hanif is a person who inclines towards truth <clears throat> and inclines away from falsehood. I put seeker of truth, I couldn't think of anything better. Some people don't even translate it. Uh, so set your face to the religion as a seeker of truth. In the primordial nature from God, which is a translation of fitrat Allah, which literally means the fitra of God, but if we say that in English, we don't understand what it means. So the translation here says the primordial nature from God, upon which he originated humankind. <clears throat> there is no substituting anything else for what God has created. That is the upright religion, but most of humankind do not know. Do this turning unto him and reverence him and perform the prayer and do not be among the idolaters, among those who have divided their religion and become factions, each party rejoicing in what it has. So this is a very important verse. We can talk about it in great detail, but we won't do that tonight. One of the things we see here is that primordial nature is there in every single human being. There are no exceptions, and when we look at some of the hadith that we'll talk about tonight, that's made explicitly clear. There are no exceptions to this rule. All human beings have this same good, basic, primordial nature. And then also the verse says that um, this primordial nature is fitrat Allah. Now the word fitrah in Arabic means the way something is created, the way its creation is originated. And everything that exists has a fitrah. Cats have one, fish have one, trees have one, and they're all perfectly made by God. But none of them are called fitrat Allah. None of them are called the fitrah that is associated directly with God. And this is a genitive construction, but if we said the fitrah of God, as I said, most people would under misunderstand it. But what it means is that this is a very praiseworthy fitrah. And in fact, it is the best of all, that human beings are given the very best of natures. And that nature of theirs takes in everything about them. It takes uh, in the way they stand erectly, the way we walk on two feet, uh, the way we eat, uh, the use of our thumb. It takes in also the perceptions that we have, the knowledge that we have. And in the Islamic conception of the, of the fitrah, every human being is endowed with an infinite gift of the knowledge of God, uh, the need and the desire to worship God. We're a race of worshipers, as Milton says, that we either, you've got to serve somebody, it might be the devil and it might be the Lord, but you've got to serve somebody. So either we have religions or we have secular alternatives to them. But, so this indicates that the fitra of the human being is distinctive, and, it, and it's very, very rich in the Islamic conception of it. In my book, I go into that, looking at a number of different sources of it. And also it says, you know, this is the fitrah of God, or from God, the one that is so great, he associates it directly with himself, just like we talk about the house of God, or the religion of God. And also that human beings are created on this fitrah, literally in Arabic, ala. And again, the use of the prepositions in the Qur'an is very subtle. But what that means is that this fitrah is 100% of us. It's not like 30% in some, 40 and others. Every human being has this fitrah permeate themselves, no matter if they turn out to be the worst of human beings or the best. There are no differences. 
And again, it cannot be, I put here, substituted for, tebdil. It has no tebdil. Some translators say it can't be altered. That's a problematic translation because it can be altered. It can be lost. Just like this human hand that we have is one of those organs in your body that has more nerves and more sensations than almost anything else. Your lips are that way too. Other parts of the bottom of your feet are like that. But if I'm a laborer working with my hands every day, maybe I don't feel anything anymore. So the hand's still the hand. It's not been substituted for another hand, but it doesn't have that same sensation. <clears throat> and although we do alter our natures, that always comes from the outside. So this is the Islamic perspective. It never comes from the inside. Our scholars will even say that if human beings were left alone just with themselves, with no negative out influences, they wouldn't lead, need law or anything. They would be upright and they would be correct. And they would be sound. Uh, so we all have that and um, this indicates, of course, that human beings are perfectly created. This is what we believe. God created human beings with souls, with bodies, with souls, with hearts, with intellects, with spirits that are free of anything contrary to the truth, that are free of any injustice or any wrong. There's nothing ugly about us in ourselves. And again, as we said, then all deviation and everything that's contrary to that, it comes from the outside. Uh, let's look at another text. This is a hadith, <clears throat> which is a statement from the Prophet, as the vast majority of you know. And this is one of the most authentic of all hadith. Kullu mawludin yuladu ala al So this says, every child is born on the fitra. Of course, that's a general statement. But if we look at other transmissions of the same hadith, all of these, by the way, are the most authentic of traditions that we have. Bukhari, Muslim, the one I just read is in Bukhari and Muslim and also in the Muwatta of Malik and of others. But the agreed narration between Bukhari and Muslim is there is no child born. Ma min mawludin illa yuladu ala al-fitrah. So there is no child born but that it is born on the fitrah. So that's a beautiful hadith because here, if there were any doubts about the universality of the statement, it's removed. Every single human being is born with this fitrah. Another transmission from Muslim, which is one of our most authentic compilations of hadith, says whoever is born is born on this fitrah. Uh, another one says every human being is given birth by his mother on the fitrah. So these are among the many proofs that show that this is, as we believe, absolutely universal. In any time, in any place, in any race, in any civilization, or people that don't have civilizations. Another hadith, uh, which is again very authentic, <clears throat> is when the Prophet said that God says, I created my servants as hanifs, as seekers of truth, people who incline towards the truth and they disincline away from falsehood. Um, so all of them are created that way. And then another one in another transmission of the same hadith, the prophet said, peace be upon him, shall I not speak to you about what God has, God glorified and majestic be he has spoken to me about in the book or in the revelation that God glorified and majestic be, he created Adam and his children as Hanifs and as Muslims. Muslim here means people in complete submission to God. So it's not the name of a dispensation, it's the name of a condition. And then also because we have these hadiths, we have others. One of our great uh, commentators, Al-Qurtubi, from the city of Cordova, 
talking about this hadith I just mentioned, that God says, I created my servants as hanifs, people inclining towards truth. He says, thus, if they die before attaining maturity, they will be in the garden. That is the standard opinion of Muslim scholarship. There are differences of opinion about that, but that is the strong opinion. Thus, if they die before attaining maturity, they will be in the garden, whether they are the children of Muslims or of disbelievers. And we have the hadith that um, the Prophet in his night journey was shown many amazing things. And um, in one of these, the Prophet accounts the different visions that he saw in the night vision, in the night journey. And so he said, then we set forth again, and we came to a beautiful green garden, Rawda Mu'tima, in which there was every beautiful color of spring. And there in the middle of the garden was a tall man whose head could hardly be seen because it was so high in the sky. And around the man there were the most children that I've ever seen. In other transmissions it says, the most beautiful children that I've ever seen. I asked them, the angelic visitors who took him, what is this man? What are those children? They said to me, let us go, let us go. And so we went. And then at the end of this hadith, which is authentic, this is in Bukhari, at the end of the hadith, uh, the prophet is addressed by the two angels. And he speaks to them. And he said, truly, tonight I have seen amazing things. So what is it that I have seen? Then they explain to him the different things he saw. And when they come to this account of the tall man, um, they say that as for the tall man in the garden, it is Abraham, peace be upon him. And as for the children around him, they are every child born that died on the fitrah, meaning they died before that's been altered. Uh, then some of the Muslims said, messenger of God, even the children of idolaters, and the messenger of God replied, even the children of idolaters. Uh, let's look again at um, a few more texts, and then uh, we'll conclude, bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. One of the most important texts that pertain to the fitrah is that of the primordial covenant. This is in the Surah of the Heights, which is number seven, verses 172 to 173. And when your Lord took from the children of Adam from their loins their progeny and made them bear witness concerning themselves, am I not, <clears throat> am I not your Lord? They said, yes, indeed, we bear witness. This was done, lest you should say on the day of resurrection, truly of this we were heedless. <clears throat> or lest you should say, it is only that our fathers ascribe partners unto God beforehand, and we were their progeny after them. Will you destroy us for that which the falsifiers have done? So this verse refers to what we call the great primordial day. It comes at the end of the world that was before. We believe in five different stages of life, a world before this one, this one, then the intermediate stage, after death, then the resurrection, then the garden and the fire. So this is a reference to the great primordial day. Um, and this verse is the cornerstone of Islamic sacred history and anthropology. Uh, it establishes that the fundamental relationship between God and all human beings is premised upon a single unmediated recognition of his lordship at the moment, or the last moment we could say, of their pre-existence in the first world. So this great primordial day is the foundation of God's purpose in creation. This is a day beyond days. It's a day not reckoned in time, even though it has a time. And this is the mithaq, as we call it, the covenant, and also it's called the ahad, the pact. 
This took place in our belief according to hadith, which are sound. This took place in Na'man. And Na'man is a dry valley that those of you who've made pilgrimage have all been over that separates the sanctuary of Mecca, which is huge, from Arafat, where we go for pilgrimage. This is called Wadi Arafah. So this is actually called Na'man. That's where it took place. And we have many hadith about it, which I talk about in my book. So this pre-earthly agreement stamps the fitra on us because we believe that God manifested himself to all of us and that we all heard his uncreated eternal speech. And that has huge implications because it means that we have his knowledge stamped upon us. Again, it makes the, this covenant incredible. But this earthly agreement, or this primordial covenant between God and all human beings then was unmediated. All other covenants were mediated by prophets and universal, every single human being. It was contracted directly between God and every one of us from the first to the last. Um, and again, this may be regarded as the basis of all later and specific covenants, all of which were mediated by prophets. Um, the Quran speaks of covenants at least 18 times. You have uh, the covenant between God and the human beings. Uh, then we have um, covenants between the believers in general. We have uh, the covenants with Abraham, with Ishmael, uh, with Abraham's progeny, uh, covenants with the children of Israel and covenants with the Christians and the peop people of the book as a whole. This is a very important topic and a good thing to study, the covenants. So this uh, meeting then, this stamps the fitra on us. And we see from this that all human beings, no matter how degraded they might be because of the oppression that they live in or the deprivation, every single human being has the most illustrious beginning of all. And this is very important. This is an extremely important belief because this has to affect the way that we look upon each other and the way that we look on human beings. Also, God declares in the Quran that most people don't keep their covenants. Right, so in surah number seven, the heights, 101 to 102, God says, these are the towns whose stories we have recounted unto you. Their messengers certainly brought them clear proofs, but they would not believe in what they had denied earlier. Thus does God set a seal upon the hearts of the disbelievers. We did not find most of them faithful to their pact. Many commentators, if not most, they say that pact is the primordial covenant. Indeed, we found most of them to be deviant. Uh, in their unfaithfulness to God's pact, it is said that, uh, in fact, that human beings have no pact at all. Literally, the verse says, we found no pact for most of them. They didn't have a pact. They didn't keep it. And what this means, they were not faithful to the pact, means that they did not continue to recognize God's lordship and his rightful claim to their obedience and worship during the course of their earthly lives. Although they took that covenant and everything necessary for it was stamped on their natures, even the desire to do it. So the verse implies that most human beings are unfaithful to their natures. And this comes up over and over again. They fail to act, we fail to act upon the intrinsic knowledge and the moral agency and responsibility that God has instilled in us. Um, so the, the fitra then is something that takes in the whole of our being. We talked about that. It takes in everything about us um, it's natural for us to stand erect. It's natural for us to walk on our feet. It's difficult for us not to do that. 
It's natural for us to eat in a particular way. It's difficult for us not to know that. But the fitra also includes those things that pertain to intellect, that pertain to the heart, and everything. It's a very comprehensive knowledge. And it is, we believe, a manifestation of God's mercy to us because we believe that human beings are given a very important task, which is stewardship on this earth. This world is not our garden. You know, it's the garden of the animals. It's the garden of the trees and of the water. You know, but to keep that pact of stewardship is very, very difficult. If we are good, everything becomes good. If we are bad, everything becomes bad. But God gives us everything we need for that. In fact, he gives us much more than we need and much more than we ever use. Um, also connected with this is the idea that faith which is ingrained in us by virtue of our fitrah, our primordial self, is something that only needs to be brought out. We only have to be reminded. So there are basically two kinds of people then from this point of view. Those who turn their backs on the fitrah and forget that it's there and forget what it is and those who allow their thoughts to delve into their fitra, to know themselves, and to remember the infinite treasures that are stored up there. And God says in the Quran, this is the refrain that goes through the whole Quran, that perhaps they may remember. And he says, in order that the people of al-bab, of true hearts, a call to remembrance. And he says, remember the blessing of God upon you and the covenant that he made with you. And this theme of dhikr and tadhakkur and tadhkir and tadhkar, this goes through the Quran as, as you know. So again, what are you remembering? You're remembering what you know. And the prophets and messengers who are given their messages by God they come to bring that out in us and to make us remember who we are and what we have in us. One of the things that God says in the Quran is that he created us with two hands, with his two hands. God said to Satan, Iblis, what prevented you from prostrating unto what I created with my two hands? Uh, he doesn't say that about anything else. God creates things with his hand, that's, that's said, with his hands. But here, I created with my two hands. Did you grow arrogant, or are you among the exalted? He said, Satan, I am better than him. You created me from fire, while you created him from clay. But here, God is saying to Iblis, um, are you really like you think? Are you really a creation more exalted than this Adamic being that I made with both my hands? I didn't make anything else like that. And the verse indicates that God undertook the creation of Adam by himself. Of course, God creates everything, but that this was a unique and special creation which all of us inherit. distinct from everything else and everything that God's hands have wrought. Um, God singled out Adam then for creation with God's two hands or by his two hands to honor him, uh, to give him karama, dignity among all human beings, and again, to make it possible for him to do what he's created to do. Ibn Arabi, he says, from the first existent thing down to the last of existent things, God did not combine both hands in anything he created except the human being. That is, in the human being's earthly and bodily and other configurations, he created everything by the divine command, but with one hand. God's two hands gave Adam a preeminence, tashrif, over all creation. All the realities in the created world were brought together in him. 
which of course makes him possibly the lowest of the low, but it also makes him the highest of the high. Everything in creation has a station. Angels have stations, cats are cats, birds are birds, but human beings, you have to find your station. And you can always go higher and higher and higher. There's no limit. We can also go lower and lower and lower. There's no bottom to the pit. All the realities in the created world were brought together in us. This was so that the human being could be the Khalifa on go of God on earth. So you know good and you know evil. There's nothing that you don't know. Even the demonic doesn't know more about evil than you know. But you weren't created to be evil. You were created to block evil. But you have to know it to do that. The world demands um, you know, uh, the divine names, and the divine names were brought together within Adam, all of them. That is why Adam was singled out for the knowledge of the names of all of them, as we believe, and also rabbinic belief emphasizes this as much as we do, maybe even in greater detail. A lot of rabbinic belief begins with Adam Qadmun, with Adam in paradise. So Adam then is an independent world. Everything else is part of that world. The world becomes complete with the creation of Adam. Adam is complete in himself. And the world is like that too. You are the microcosm, it is the macrocosm. If you get yourself right, it gets itself right. It is incomplete without you, you're complete without you. It is complete without it, but you are complete without, did I say that right? It is incomplete without you, and it, you're complete without it. The two hands emphasize God's power in Adam's creation, and that God created Adam without an intermediary. There was no father, there was no mother. It alludes also to the diverse activities involved in Adam's creation. Um, Abu al-Qasim Qushayri, one of our great spiritual masters and teachers, he says about the creation of Adam by God's two hands, what God deposited in Adam is not found in anyone or anything else, so that God's special favor and the special khususiyah, the special status that he gives to human beings become manifest in Adam and in his children. Um, one of our great scholars, Jandi, we have great Persian scholars, he's one of them. He says the reality of Iblis, of Satan, contradicts the reality of Adam in everything. The reality of Adam is the manifest form of the unity of the all comprehensiveness of everything brought together by God in the engendered worlds. So that's Adam, he brings everything together. And that's who we're supposed to be also. God brought his two hands together in Adam only because humanness is a reality requiring equilibrium, i'tidal, and balance. And the perfection of bringing together both the, um, the thingness of things and the manyness of things is all in that. In contrast, the reality of Iblis is disequilibrium and unbalance. Iblis becomes defined by the particular ego, which we call in our tradition al ananiyat al juziya the partial ego. He is delimited by seeking exaltation, by claiming eminence, by manifestation of the self as ego, rising up against the reality of truth and of the one. And he's veiled by that. This reality requires a fiery separation that rise up, rises up against other elements. Khunawi, one of our great scholars, he says, um, the interrelationship of God's two hands brings all correlation and polarity in the world into existence. And all of those correlations and polarities are, of course, in us, 
who can be the highest of the high and the lowest of the low. It establishes the fundamental created dualities, such as the seen and the unseen. It sets up the fundamental human perceptions, such as declaring similarity between God and creation, or between creation and God, and incomparability, tenzi. All movement, all change, all process in the world are traced back to this reality of the two hands. Uh, let's conclude now. So we believe in our tradition, in what some people have called transcendent humanism. And um, I always like to mention this if I get a chance, but among the books that really everyone has to have, especially students at Zaytuna, is The Rise of Humanism by George Makdisi. This was a great Christian Arab scholar, a real scholar. And he shows that the rise of human, humanism in the West, we won't say that it's not indebted to the Greeks and to the Hellen Hellenic tradition, but it's fundamentally indebted to us also. The rise of humanism. In fact, Pico de la Mirandola, who is one of the great um, ideologues of the Renaissance, and he writes a book on man, which is called the Manifesto of the Renaissance. But he says in that, he's speaking to Catholic priests, and he says, Reverend Fathers, I'm not gonna quote what he said because I forgot, but basically what he's saying is that he is the measure of all things, which is the Renaissance language. As I learned from Abdullah the Saracen, which means Abdullah the Arab. And who is Abdullah the Saracen? Probably Abdullah ibn Qutayba, who is one of our humanists who wrote about that many centuries before Pico. Pico knew Arabic, by the way, and he knew Hebrew, and he knew many things. But the human being is either everything or nothing. And although we can speak honestly about in-between, there is no excluded middle, but the reality is really that. We have to strive to be everything, and if we don't do that, in the end, it's as if we were nothing. And some of us do, in fact, become nothing. Um, Nejmuddin al-Razi, another great Persian um, metaphysician, says, in kneading the clay of Adam, all the attributes of the Satans, and the predators, and the beasts, and the plants, and the minerals, and the inanimate objects were actualized in us. However, the clay was singled out for the attribution of by my two hands. Hence, each of these blameworthy attributes became a shell, and within each shell was placed a pearl of a divine attribute. Each of these things, the, these potential evils we have, they're like a shell. And in each of them is a pearl. That's if we, are, we live as the human beings we're supposed to be. And then he goes on to say, the human frame belongs to the lowest of the low, while the human spirit belongs to the highest of the high. The wisdom of this is that human beings have to carry the burden of the trust and the pact the knowledge of God, and to be stewards in his earth. Hence, they have to possess the strength of both worlds to a perfection. They possess, possess this strength through attributes, not through form. Life, knowledge, power, will, hearing, seeing, speech, and so forth. Since the human spirit pertains to the highest of the high, nothing in the world of spirits, even angels, can have its strength. And in the same way, the human soul pertains to the lowest of the low. So that nothing in the world of the souls or the physical beings um, can have its strength, whether a beast or a predator or anything else. So our transcendent humanism then is based on the idea of the insan al-kamil, of the perfect human being. The human, and this is the purpose of religion for us. You know, religion is to know God. It is to worship God. It is to know God. 
It is to be his steward on earth, but also you can't do that without perfection. And we have the power to perfect ourselves, but this is in following the way of the prophets and the messengers and the great saints. So the goal of the human being, therefore, is balance and harmony. Everything is that. And in the Greek tradition, you see that understood perhaps more perfectly than um, any other Western tradition. The goal of the human being is balance, harmony, and perfection, kamal. We must arise and become al-insan al-kamil, the perfect human being. And you must in that move beyond al-insan al hayawan the human being who's an animal. To become a perfected human being is not only the highest possible human aspiration, it is the only proper human aspiration. Human beings who do not actualize their beautiful and majestic and unique form are less than human. We can only become perfect through absolute servanthood, through ibadah, through ubudiya, through ubuddha. Each of these has a special meaning. For nearness to God only comes through that. God is the real. This is what we believe, isn't it? The absolute, al-haqq. Uh, the more that you approach him, the more real you become. The more real you become, the more balanced you become. Beauty is the splendor of truth, right? That the, the universal routing of beauty is God is the truth. God is beautiful. He loves beauty. Then as you come close to him and are made real by him, you become inwardly beautiful, which is balanced, harmonious, just, virtuous. And then you radiate beauty. And this is why we see in any sound civilization or culture that human beings are extremely beautiful in everything they do. God is the real, so the closer that we approach him, the more real we become. And um, with that, I'd like to conclude. May God enable us in this incredible college that you have here in this incredible place to bring this truth to light. This is our tradition, but then who knows it in this time? Even we ourselves are among the most ignorant people of it. Well, thank you very much. Wassalamu